Welcome to Healing Sound Movement Television. My name is John Kontemulder. Go to healingsoundmovement.com. Also check worldpeacechild.com and go to YouTube slash Healing Sound Movement for all our videos, interviews and TV dialogues. Again, a very international and interesting guest today, Susan Joy Renison. But leave out the joy for the website, but not in life, especially not her <laughs> life, because it's a very joyful life and a serious life at the same time. SusanRenison.com. Check out her book, amazing book. As you can see, I really read it. Look, all those lines. I really study it. It's an amazing book, Tuning the Diamonds. Uh, it's about electromagnetism and spiritual evolution. Uh, that's for the international listeners, for the Dutch uh, listeners and viewers. Uh, ga je naar ankhermes.nl, want daar is het boek ook verkrijgbaar als Afstemmen op de Kosmos. So, tuning the diamonds. So, welcome, Susan, to this edition. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak with you this evening, today. You're, you're welcome. Um, in your introduction of the book, uh, let me see what you literally say. It's very interesting, I think. Uh, the first... Not the initiation, that's also very interesting. Introduction. You are saying, we are living in extraordinary times. I completely agree. In my own book, Blueprint, um, I wanted to use the first sentence, reality isn't what it used to be. Then I found out Dean Radin had used it in Entangled Minds. But it seems that we have a similar introduction to uh, reality. Can you explain, because for the listeners, uh, I know you're uh, uh, a physicist, Geophysics mm -hmm. also, University at Liverpool, but you also uh, are a natural healer, I might say, uh, an author, but especially a researcher of the relationship between electromagnetism, life, and our spiritual evolution. Um, could you explain to our listeners, to the broad viewers, what your view is of how reality is different now than it used to be? That's actually quite a big question sure. and also something that I've been emphasising in my lectures. Um, th the first thing really is that uh, I've been spending a lot of time teaching people about the changes taking place to our reality and to the, this planet. The fact that the planet is now being flooded with huge amounts of cosmic energy. Energy is seeping into our solar system, affecting all the different planets and also um, our shielding, the shielding around our planet is also um, declining. At times it's, um, we virtually don't have any shielding and so the planet is being flooded um, with cosmic radiation. And this means that there are problems, sort of we have events, um, major events where we have lots of issues with the satellites, lots of energy coming into the atmosphere, but even just on a day by day basis now there seems to be major issues, things that seem to be happening. Scientists are starting to talk about the arrival of dark matter streams into our solar system. Mm. They're talking about um, the, the issues, things that they don't understand anymore. Uh, they, t they talk about the, uh, on the International Space Station that uh, they're measuring positrons, which is an antimatter version of the electron. That's something that's not supposed to happen, and they say, oh, maybe this is to do with dark matter. Then we're having flyby anomalies where they can't understand why the satellites aren't moving to within the laws that they've, they've understood in the past. And they're talking about quantum effects. Then we have things like the rate of radioactive decay. Scientists are saying, well, we've always believed it's a constant, but we've noticed that there's a relationship with what's happening on the sun. Mm. And uh, we notice that the rate of radioactive decay varies and they're even thinking of using it as a, a prediction for space weather. But then we, we have other things like even satellites around our planet appearing and disappearing. Again, there's this mutter about a change in the background radiation of our reality. So it, it's, question, it's, it's interesting because what is reality? But we do know that there is a lot of matter that we can't detect, mm -hmm. but our theory suggests it has to exist. On the metaphysical front, people say, well, we know that there is an unseen realm and we know we have a relationship with that unseen realm. We know that there is elements um, that exist. Um, they are physical elements, maybe very ethereal, but we also breathe that energy in and it's part of our dynamics and our, and our makeup. 
So in terms of our reality, there is a lot of talk of our reality shifting, a lot of evidence. The other thing I didn't mention was um, the fact that atomic weights are changing. So like mm. platinum, the weight, atomic weight of platinum varies, which means it's now starting to get difficult in terms of um, specialists. You know, when you're buying and selling, you have to know what you're buying and selling. I mean, sure. literally, but things like the weight's changing. So the unseen realm is becoming more, I impacting more on the physical realm, even for on the scientific level. On a spiritual level, um, we breathe in spiritual enemies, uh, uh, um, energies. Mm. Our human, the human energy field is made up of a plasma. Th the etheric side of us that controls the physical, it, it, there must be some kind of impact. So scientists are even thinking, well, you know, what is the impact? And they've even been looking at what they think is happening. Um, and also, you know, they're actually doing research on how the quantum world could be affecting the physical. Mm. Uh, that, to me, is quite surprising. Through the biofield. Um, well, just the, just the physics of billions of particles moving through us. Yes, literally. And what, literally billions mm. of particles, and what actually happens does, is the physical affected? And I'm now saying it's not the physical that we should be worried about. Mm -hmm. It's the etheric templates that control the physical. What's happening to those? So I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but in terms of our... You've answered all my questions, I think. <laughs> but in terms, of, um, mm -hmm. in terms of our reality, there's, there's no doubt that an unseen world is affecting um, and impinging on this reality. The metaphysical community talk about spiritual energies. Um, we've had people like Johann Reich mm -hmm. that says that um, there is cosmic vital energy in the atmosphere. The organ. The organ energy. Um, but obviously this has been called many different names by many Art, different cultures. By different cultures. Mm -hmm. We now have um, the work of people like David Hudson who was looking at um, was, he was actually prospecting for gold and he found um, certain elements in the gold that he couldn't identify. He knew that they were different. Eventually he came up with the fact that these were precious metals that were in a new state of matter. And what that means is that like water can be like in a um, state of a solid like ice or a liquid water or a gas which is steam, mm. you can have certain precious metals like platin platinum and iridium, osmium I think is one of them, copper I think as well, um, they can go into a state which um, means that they're invisible mm. um, to normal detection but in that state they seem to have quite amazing properties and of course people talk about the white powder of gold almost. which is which is like almost which is like a, a physical version of this. Mm. So in terms of um, the quantum realm it seems to me that we do have issues um, identifying what exactly we're talking about. When people talk about seeing auras and seeing colours, mm. um, we have a real difficulty talking, what realm are you talking about? What frame of reference? What frame of reference? Mm. Are we talking, are you seeing things in the infrared, the ultraviolet? Are you seeing something in the, um, the electromagnetic spectrum that most people can't see? Mm. That's my question, but I do know, we do know that there is definitely um, elements in the atmosphere and the fact that we're having these huge geomagnetic storms, huge deliveries of energy. There's a whole story going um, taking place of this energy seeping into the solar system, um, coming in neutral um, when it gets past the barrier, then it's been affected by the solar wind. There seems to be this dynamics of the solar wind stripping off electrons, charging up, then this becomes highly charged um, subatomic matter, it gets flung out to the heliopause, which is the barrier, gets getting caught up in the electric fields and then being um, literally um, flying towards the centre of the solar system uh, to near the speed of light. We're talking mm. um, uh, issues like a, a, what they're calling them anomalous cosmic rays, but there's definitely a change taking place. Then the sun acts as a focus, like a lens, and then we get these massive eruptions. Now the Russians told us um, they did a report in 1997 called the Planeto Physical Report of State of Earth and Life. And um, Dimitriev, by the way? Yes, I yes. think I might have garbled the title, but yeah. that's the main source of the yeah. title. Um, and they talked about the fact that the 
the, the fabric of space has actually changed. They've actually said that space has become more permeable. Uh, and because of that, it's, that seems to be what the change is. One thing I've been saying in my lectures is that the, the scientists are changing their tunes. Um, space scientists are now... Um, before, when I was a student and when I was at you know, youth school, um, space was a cold, dark place where nothing ever happened. But now they're saying space is, turn, is not a benign env environment. Mm. They're saying that spacecraft at times are having to fight their way through a molasses. It's like molasses. They're saying it's like a particle mm. soup. It's so thick with particles. That is something quite tremendous. The vacuum is a plenty. The vacuum is the vacuum is seething mm. with particles. A zero point energy. Um, that is quite amazing, and they're confessing this. And uh, um, the things like even in the last month, NOAA, the National um, now let's get this right, National and Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States, mm -hmm. that are responsible for space weather. They're now saying that space weather is now a new national priority. It's become very, very important because we're having issues with the, the protection around our planet. Mm -hmm. The Van Allen belts are becoming very dynamic. In 2003, we had um, what they call the Halloween storms, where um, there was like two weeks of storming and, and major solar flares, major coronal mass ejections. Um, the Van Allen belt, apparently, now I've been studying this subject for a long time mm -hmm. and I do a lot of reading, but I've only just found out that scientists say that the outer Van Allen belts were virtually destroyed. We're having issues where they're becoming very dynamic. Instead of two belts, there's now sometimes three belts. That's causing a problems for the satellite controllers. So the environment, the cosmic environment is becoming very, very stormy. NASA mm. released a... Um, a video in August 2011, I believe it was, where they turned a satellite to watch what happens when we have this mass. It's a coronal mass ejection. It's literally where the surface of the sun just lifts off and flies into space, gets flung into space. Mm -hmm. And they watched as this event took place. And it's literally like a hurricane in space, the particles. They normally talk about billions of tons of matter, but sometimes with big storms, it's half a trillion tons of matter being flung towards the Earth. Mm -hmm. And it's literally, the Earth is just like a tiny speck and there's this huge wave of energy coming over. The Earth is picking up this charge. The energy is coming into the Earth and of course, even though there's a lot of denial about what's taking place, it mm -hmm. is affecting the climate, um, it is affecting um, what's actually taking place on this planet and it's also affecting us as well. Well that's my next question because if cosmoplanetary action and change in dynamics which mm. is going on, mm. and we know this for many years now and now mm. they're finally taking action but what can they do? I'm thinking of the work of Paul uh, Violet, we mm. uh, organized an event with him in Amsterdam a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, he also has, uh, talks about this cosmic uh, charge. It's an electrical, multidimensional uh, universe where charge and electricity and electromagnetism is a um, well, central aspect of this, this whole dynamic. But would you say that we are talking about normal electromagnetism? Because what I think is fascinating, if you look at bioholographics mm -hmm. or radionics, psychotronics, uh, you know that field as well. Scalar electromagnetics, mm -hmm. uh, torsion energy, we can go into that later maybe. Um, but it seems to be that if you uh, use a psychic or a ESP ps uh, a spy, uh, for instance, and you put him in a Faraday cage, theoretically there would be no interference of uh, electricity and magnetism, electromagnetism. But it still works and it seems to work non-locally at long distances where the field should be weaker if it's normal electro magnetism. So what kind of electromagnetism or charge distribution are we talking about, you think? I think what you're saying and, and the way I would look at the subject is that when we're having this energy, it's also information. Yes. So you're having these informational fields. One of the things that people have been asking me about, obviously they're quite concerned about their own evolution and, and their own um, status and what's going to happen to them, any sort of physical effects. What we're now learning is that um, DNA responds to changes in the environment. 
so that if um, the environment changes, then DNA automatically starts to change to sort of, uh, mm. to, for the, any form of life to, a, to, a, to adapt. Mm. Um, so the point is, is that DNA requires instructions. So we talk about, and the metaphysical community tends to talk about templates, but there seems to be a need for instructions. Mm. Um, and I believe that that's also blowing in the cosmic wind as well. I believe that the instructions are also, new instructions are also coming. So like energetic codes, so to speak? That I believe so, I believe so. I mean, one of the things I found out um, in my studies is that I don't tend to just believe things that people sure. tell me. And I like to go looking for what's been done in the scientific community. Because at the end of the day, there's an awful lot of people that are getting paid to do research and nobody knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so very That's often true. when you start so hunting around, you find some very valuable information. Um, I know the metaphysical community talk about light codes. And I've known people who've been trying to work with them. But I actually found out that um, scientists have been investigating um, phosphenes for a good 200 years. Yes. Um, and that basically it appears to me that like the coding for our reality can be seen at some level of our consciousness. Some people seem to be able to interpret these patterns, they're patterns that sort of, of that form our reality. Mm. Um, they but have the, access to them. They seem to have the ability to sort of see these images in their mind's eyes. Yes. And what happened was I was comparing um, what people were drawing as light codes with mm. what the scientists had, um, and because basically they were interviewing lots and lots of people. Hundreds of hundreds of people have seen these codes. And so you can actually see them in this like I think about 16 different main ones, and there's variants on these. Um, but what surprised me in the research was the fact that um, NASA have admitted that astronauts also see these light codes. And it seems to be far easier to see them when you're out in space mm. than when you're on this planet. Yeah, and they seem to have plane. and they seem to have problems sleeping mm. because as they're going to sleep, they're starting to see all these images mm. um, sliding into their awareness. And I've spoken to people who have said that the same thing. It comes in a, a sort of like a slideshow, and you see these images. So that um, those templates, those energies, they're also in the field. They're also and I believe that uh, as part of the changes taking place, we are getting these new templates. I believe that is part of our reality. It's not just energy, it's information, instructions mm -hmm. for um, a new earth. I information believe. transfer. Yes, and mm -hmm. so these scalar fields, even though they are very, um, in terms of a tiny amount of energy, they're very, very important, they're, they're needed. They're, they're coding and instructions, and they are part of the fabric of our reality too. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you're going to start saying, "Well, where do they come from?" Well, this is what that's your question. But this you is the, well, this is what well. the this is what the intelligent mm -hmm. design people yeah. say. They say, "Well, where do all these instructions come sure. from?" And of course, that's quite a sort of philosophical question. Then, at that yes, point, we could also ask the question: If this is, let's say, a holographic reality, uh, where's the holographic plate, and who's putting those? codes out because if it's a holographic reality but the hologram itself seems to be changing and we have a reciprocal relationship to the changing cosmos changing us mm. um, this feels actually like uh, the all hermetic philosophy and statement mm. as above so below so within so without mm. are we seeing this essence more and more in science as well you think i feel we've got a real problem um, in that the reality is pressing the changes are so swift that scientists are sort of, you know, before they could get away with just saying it's like this and, they, and we had to accept it. But with the change, the changes are so coming so quickly that their theories are not um, standing up to, to scrutiny because mm. there's so much that's in their faces. More and more anomalies come in, so the yeah, theory more is more not complete. Yeah. Yes, that's that mm. sort of thing. So yeah. um, at the moment, with the, I'm not a biologist and I, sure. I shouldn't really... Um, talk too much on this subject but um, from what I understand they're talking about um, different life forms having the ability to evolve the structure the instructions for evolution are already inbuilt but then they don't want to go any further than that mm -hmm. you know it, it, it's too difficult to then say well how how did that come about 
I talked to Piotr Garyaev and Rupert Sheldrake, both mm -hmm. did interviews mm -hmm. with them, and they also seem to acknowledge the fact that those information codes mm. changes the information field the DNA needs, mm. which changes the physical outcome of our blueprint. So mm. if the hologram, mm. if that changes, humanity changes. Could mm. you say that? Well, yes, that's exactly how it's going to work. And um, now some people are saying that we also have a part in this and that our consciousness um, has a part. And I think that is true, that um, we give our permission, that we, you know, we are part of the equation for mm -hmm how the evolutionary changes are going to take place. And I do believe that there is a spiritual component, a sort of high level spiritual component in the energy that's flooding our planet. That's my belief. But can I ask a critical question? Mm -hmm. Can we really tune the diamond? Because I would say only to a certain extent, because one way, yes, we are the creators of our reality, but then again, we have consensus reality. So uh, what's the complete um, interaction of all our consciousness working with the fabric of reality and matter. And on the other hand, we need to understand that the cos cosmoplanetary aspects also control and influence us. So what about this dynamic? I feel that we are actually going through a cycle that, we, that comes and goes. It's, it's you know, a part of a cycle. Um, and at this point in the cycle, there's a, it's like a housekeeping event. It's like um, something that comes on a regular basis. It's time to inspect the creation. It's time for um, a, a known shift. Um, maybe, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I'm just a cough here. Maybe we have to start to, some life forms are no longer, will fit into this new environment, so they, they'll go extinct. Some will flourish in this environment. Humans, Will there be a new type of human? Does that mean that some humans are they're gonna, not going to be able to reincarnate on the planet or they will die off? Um, those are questions that I think should be addressed to philosophers sure. and to people who have studied this quite strongly. But I feel that, um, that maybe some, there will be some kind of split and that some people will advance more quickly and others will be more slow to catch up. Mm. Just take a drink. All of a sudden, this glass materialized, so that's very important. It wasn't there to begin with. I'm, <laughs> I'm honest, I'm not joking. It wasn't there to begin with. That gave me some time to think of the next question. Um, what about in the Russian biophysics and the sciences? Uh, they've been early with Gurwich and, of course, Gariev, Kasnet, Gariev, <coughs> with those cosmoplanetary factors kicking in and conscious, consciousness reflecting this reality also. Uh, what about our biophotonic input and also output? Because if you uh, give a substance, a toxic substance to a human being, a cancerous uh, substance, the biophotonic emissions actually um, change the frequency of that substance. So the field coming out, so to speak, to put it in simple terms, is different than the input field. So what do you think happens when we're talking about input of cosmic rays and scalar electromagnetic radiation coming from the cosmos. What's working? Let's take a sip first, because then I can prolong the question here. Is it just biophotonics, the light that's coming from our DNA that does something, or is it the biofield, or is it both? What do you think is the processing within the human being of all those uh, cosmic radiations and em emanations coming in? That's a really good question, and I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer that. Um, <coughs> I am struggling a little bit here. It's okay. Um, when I wrote my book, it was because I was very interested in the human energy field and what was taking place. I was because also my interest in physics and geophysics, I was quite concerned about questions of, um, of people struggling with the energies taking place. And with all my research that I did, I believed that that the muttering that I'd heard was accurate and that people would have issues. My main um, point of view is um, about was was originally about <coughs> balance. It was the fact that um, that it seems to be that the energies coming in seem to. <coughs> sorry about this. That's coffee. also the energies coming in and coming out. So no, uh, um, don't bother. <laughs> the the fact that the human energy field seems to have an emotional component. So this is the higher dimensional components 
of the human being seems to have a strong mental and emotional aspect. And so when this, the field is imbalanced, the energy seems to be attracted to whatever is the most um, heavily focused parts of the mm. human energy field. So from my point of view, I was trying to identify the science that could justify the belief that people had to be completely in balance. Mm -hmm. um, I only sort of, I believe only partially um, got it when I wrote the, the main um, book that was first published. Uh, subsequently, there's been, I've done more research and I feel that, um, <coughs> I feel that I was uh, justified in, in my beliefs um, that we, we do have to pay attention to the human energy field and that we really do have to um, focus on how we um, interact with the, the cosmos. And yes. I know it sounds very strange, but um, the, the brain seems to have a function of controlling other parts of the body. It seems to be sort of a, it's a control centre. Mm -hmm. And we, we link up to the Schumann resonance, and that seems to be like a carrier frequency for other energies. And that filters through the body, through to the heart. There seems to be some kind of interaction between the head and the heart. Mm -hmm. the, so there is a need um, to, f to, I believe, there's, there's a need to sort of um, allow ourselves to focus inwardly on this connection with the earth and also with the cosmos. And I, I, I try to uh, say this in the book. Now, I know that you're talking about um, what happens when there's um, currents floating around the planet, when there's X-rays coming in, when there's gamma rays coming in, when there's electrons coming in. You're saying, how does the body react? But, I, I, but, I, but I feel that the human energy field acts as a filter. And the, mm -hmm. and the emphasis on the diamonds was to say that there seems to be a part, a, a, a one level, there seems to be... Um, some kind of geometry that's a, that is a, a subsequence of the fields that we have. It's it's um it's an artifact of the fields, um, and also as I say, I've done further work, and I've, I feel I've confirmed this even more. Mm -hmm. Where there's a diamond field that seems to act as a receiver and a transmitter of the signals, and so that it's mm -hmm. it's acting to filter out um, fields that I don't that humans don't actually require. Mm. Um, Sorry about this. No, that's okay. By the way, people, um, Susan Joy Renison, because Guido from wanttoknow.nl, free publicity, is also here um, on invitation of Guido, but also two other organizers did three to four, maybe five events here in the Netherlands. Yes, I've done so a lot of talking in recent days. It's not just I the mean, lectures. I talk I've a lot, <laughs> but she has done a lot of talking. Okay. So, so it's not just the lectures. I've, it's been talking to people every day, all day. The for backstage days. thing going on until <laughs> so late hours. So um, my voice is actually shot. So <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. But um, so basically, what I found was that there was a, a diamond field. I also found that um, at the nano scale. Um, there is also, um, a, if you pass an, um, a magnetic field through um, a nanoscale tube, a diamond appears as well. Mm. So I feel that the diamond field is actually a reflection of DNA. And that's my conclusion, that my new conclusion as well. That's where the diamond field comes from. Mm -hmm. So there is, an, there is an element of the field itself acting as a filter yes. for higher and energies. a protective layer, therefore. Yes, yes. and I feel that the more sophisticated we become and our intent seems to program the field um, so that energy is filtered. This, now by obviously, the, but obviously this, by the way, we also know it's true, coming from radionics, right? The work of George uh, de La War and uh, Albert Abrams, mm -hmm. Ruth Drown, is showing that our thoughts, intentions, our thought fields, like mm -hmm. Tupac in Tibetan Buddhism mm -hmm. almost, uh, change the dynamics of that field mm -hmm. that's in relationship with the emanations coming from matter and cosmos, right? Mm. So I feel that um, I, I'm not a, a big thing. Uh, I'm not really into all this give your intent and ignore all the sure. other signals. I'm not into sort of um, how can I put this politely without sounding rude? Change your reality. <laughs> do, it, do it yourself and let the cosmos do its own thing. I, I'm not it's into... It's more complicated, you mean? 
I think it is a little bit more complicated mm. than that. But I do think generally that with the changes taking place, um, there is there is a sort of a push to sort of push humanity in a new direction. I do believe that, but I do think humans seem to have some kind of uh, certain breaks on it. Mm -hmm. I think it's more breaks rather than completely stopping it. That's what I feel. Is it a break or is it a chance <coughs> for transformation? <coughs> Sorry, out here. I'm sorry. There's still some water, otherwise I'll get really some sorry. more. No, that's okay. Is, um, it, uh, is it just a break the human can uh, step into, literally, or is it a chance for transformation? Is it like a, a um, challenge almost? I, I just feel it's like um, some people are more permeable than others. They're more accepting of change. Other people, their resistance has to be broken down. So it's... Um, I think it's, if you think of it as like water, some people, the way the water can filter through quite easily, other mm. people it's a bit more of a challenge. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I do believe that, um, that all humans will change. And also you've got to think in terms of the morphogenetic fields for, for humanity. You've got this um, tipping point, which scientists now agree exists. Once you get to a certain tipping point, then you get like a very quick um, transition. Like chaos theory. If we are here and then we tip to... Mm. So mm. they've identified that there, th that there seems to be um, this mechanism where you get to a certain level and then all of a sudden it, it, there's a rapid change. And I think they that call it critical mass, but we're not talking about mass here. No, so they d <laughs> well they do, do talk about critical mass, the hundredth monkey, and all that sort yes. of thing. Yeah. But I, I feel that it's a principle, mm. and that that principle also applies to humans. Yes. And so I feel that what I'm saying is that you're always going to get the, the people ahead, the, the forerunners, the people who are the, and they're the ones that lead the way, that the make it easier, yeah. the pioneers, it makes it easier mm. for other people. So that's what I, that's what I feel. I've probably been taking a long, a long way of getting to that point of saying that. But um, in terms of the, the, the physics and the biophysics, I'm not an expert on that subject, so I'm not going to talk sure. in too much detail on that. But generally from the work that I've done and what's taking place and what the evolutionary biologists are saying, um, that <coughs> DNA will change. The instructions will come from somewhere. I've been even learning about um, there's new types of DNA that just appears from nowhere. They've got a special name for it as well. Mm. I know junk DNA, but no, that's not no, what you mentioned. Right? No, it's not junk no. DNA. Mm. Literally just DNA that spontaneously appears mm. and that gets, that's utilised. There's a special name for it, I should Coming remember. from self-organisation in a way. Well, it just appears in, in, mm. the, in the makeup. Okay. And um, this, is, this is quite fascinating. Again, the intelligent design people say, where does it come from? <laughs> of course. <laughs> so where does that go on? <laughs> but um, we seem to be able to adapt quickly and I do really feel that as um, as the planet starts to things start to really rock and roll on this planet with the you know with the earth shielding basically collapsing um, and allowing the energies in I mean the unit um, the scientists are saying saying it nicely they're saying that mother earth is lowering her shields I mean that's a nice way to put it mm. but it's it's got to the state now where it's like a, uh, the European Space Agency say it's like a sieve, energy's pouring in. There's new types of space weather as well, which has surprised me because I've been following this for eight to nine mm. years now. They're talking about the energy coming in from the radiation belts. It's literally raining on into the earth. Um, and they're quite concerned about how that's going to affect the climate. I'm quite concerned about humans. Mm. Scientists are talking, uh, interested in the climate and they're talking, uh, worried about their satellites and their technologies. Communication devices. They're, they're worried about the technological side, but there is a biological side as well. But that's not really getting a lot of attention at the moment. Why is that, you think? We don't have to go in there if you want to talk some more about the other side. I personally feel that... Um, I, I, I want to know why the metaphysical community aren't really talking more about this. Mm -hmm. That's from my point of view. I know that the biologists, they have all their, you know, mandates to look at DNA and sure. stuff like that. And the materialistic and reductionistic science. Is and the, and the, med and the medicine and stuff like that. Sure. But there seems to be a gap. There seems to be a gap where people are not really taking it seriously enough. Mm -hmm. How do we cope in a stormy geomagnetic environment? The, there does seem to be, well, the, the facts are, we know for a fact that there's more accidents when 
um, with those geomagnetic storms. There's more heart attacks, there's more blood pressure problems, there is more physical ailment problems. Mm. More people become unstable in these environments. Um, so my attitude seems to be <coughs> there really does need to be more study and more interest. I, I did like what I heard when I was involved with the metaphysical community. However, it, due to politics and personalities sure. and things like that, it didn't quite work out for me. But <coughs> I feel that um, we really need to take this seriously. Mm. I, uh, you know, things are dramatically changing. Um, scientists are being forced to go to the government and ask for more money mm. to, um, to, to be able to sort of monitor the situation and to be able to mitigate the, 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 the issues that they have. We have problems now that telling people if you're a frequent flyer, you have to worry about the amount of cosmic radiation you're getting. Mm -hmm. Um, th there's there's all sorts of different things like when now they have they're hoping to fly a lot more over the poles but when there's space weather they literally have to uh, divert the planes yeah, they have um, to adjust their <coughs> polar um, equipment the settings well, well the point is nothing works mm. no radio co radio communications there's complete blackouts at yeah, times that might be a problem in the plane yes yeah so so that is a major issue mm. so for me um, Okay, that's the technological side, but what about the... What about us? What about the human side? What about us in this environment? I do believe that if people have a strong energy field, that's going to act as a shield. Mm. You, you know, your energy field is made up of plasma, and the facts are that um, a plasma, even if it's a thousand times less dense than air, can defield um, a beam of electrons, mm. you know, to a certain extent. And I think that the facts are in the public domain. It's just... Um, where's the will to, under to really understand this? And I do think there needs to be more cooperation between scientists and the metaphysical community. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that. But I feel that <coughs> willingness and, let's say, the information field is also interacting with our willingness. And if we, the people, want to have the willingness to accept that we need to adjust to this uh, coming change and the change that's already been going on for years, we need to know that it's true in the first place. Isn't that the big problem that the ordinary Joe in the street doesn't know about uh, cosmic rain, so to speak, space weather, that reality is actually bioelectromagnetic, bioacoustic, bioholographic, multidimensional? They don't even believe the fact that we have an energy field. It, exactly. It's, it's woo-woo stuff, and it's just a total fact. What I found interesting is when I've been doing my research is the Russians. The Russians have spent decades looking at all this. Yes. There was a paper published in the last month or six weeks or something wh where it sort of summarised the fact that the Russians spent 90 years looking at these alternative energies, torsion fields. It mentioned the pyramid work that they did, all sorts of um, um, work that they did to understand alternative realities or yes. all, all this alternative mysterious, w mysterious world. They spent an awful lot of time trying to understand it. Energetics from and, consciousness and to matter. The thing that I normally talk about mm. that really gets me sort of quite agitated mm. is that the Russians have no problems licensing their healers. True. They say, well, we know that when you're channeling this um, cosmic energies, <coughs> your brain goes into a state that's unique to healers and, and people who are, you know, high quality meditators, you know, there's sort of certain types of meditators and gurus who, who go into a certain brain state. Yeah. There's only very few people, healers and, and gurus and, you know, expert meditators that can get to this state. Mm -hmm. So if you can prove that you can get to this state, here's your license. Yes. There's no problem, there's no issue, just do, you know, you pay for the license or proof of the testing and you can have your license. But the thing is, because we also and interviewed on Korotkov, and the thing is, from the 1920s, they've been having biophysics labs in the first place. So their mm. whole approach is also to ESP and consciousness and parapsychology and biophysics is more biophysical and electromagnetically uh, biased. The right way, so to speak, not biochemical and materialistic. But, but it's not seen as bizarre or weird. Exactly. It's just normal. That's yeah. It's just a fact of life. Yes. And that is what I think really gets me agitated. Mm. I think they just, it's like the pyramids, the fact that they've built these massive pyramids around Moscow and they've done all these experiments and, they, and the Russian people love the, the pyramids. And if you mention that to certain people, they just look at you like, that's a bit weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not, it's just, um, it's another way of understanding our reality, the way I think of it in terms of 
there are many different rules and principles that underlie, underlie how the universe functions. And most of the time, scientists only know some of the rules. Mm. And then there's a few curious people that go looking for extra rules to understand our reality. Yeah. This is what the type of person I am. I'm looking for what those rules are so that I can understand my reality better. The Russians seem to be the one people on the planet that go looking for all the rules yes. and to understand the rules as a sort of the big picture. Like you, they're also <coughs> multidisciplinary truth seekers in a way. And so I feel that um, because of the issue of the changes on the planet and because it's so sudden, more people need to be really curious about understanding our reality and what's really out there um, and how that affects us, what we can do to help ourselves through this transition. Mm. You know, we should, we should all be wanting to be pioneers, especially the people who are interested in, in science and metaphysics. We should be sort of leading the rest of society. That's my belief. Mm. You know, not with, because we want to be... Um, not because we want to be sort of seen, you know, we don't, not because we want to be in the limelight, but because we care about humanity. And to understand life and our spiritual evolution. But, but we care about humanity mm -hmm. and that we, we think maybe we've got something that we can help others with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I mean, there's a lot of people with a lot of beliefs, they've done a lot of study. They can reassure people that, you know, you don't have to become an odd part. <laughs> you don't have to be... Um, a weirdo or something mm -hmm. like that. It's, it's just opening your eyes and seeing that there's more, there's more rules. And seeing the evidence that lies there before your eyes. There's, like there's more rules that can help us appreciate yes. what this, our reality, how it really works. Mm -hmm. um, that's my point of view and I, I feel um, it's now getting critical though. Mm -hmm. It really is now getting critical. Um, also because of the shifting reality, people are seeing more things. People are changing. Um, I happen to be a um, synesthete, where that means is that your senses are blended. Mm. Um, and over the last 30 to 40 years, there's been a tremendous increase in psychologists and psych um, psychotherapists and um, neuro neurologists of the fact that people seem to be seeing uh, more or they're being able to identify things through their, their senses. The veils are lifting? S well, people are seeing more colours. You've got the issue of people associating letters with um, music or ah, music synesthesia. with... Synesthesia. Yeah, the okay. synesthesia, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what I have is this thing with the smell where um, sometimes when I'm talking with people, I start to pick up their energies. Sorry, my food. socks are quite old, <laughs> so I have to apologise. But please, well, go I, on, go on. Well, I can... I, I sort of sense things quite clearly and specific things with people, but that's just only one. Apparently there's 63 different types of synesthesia mm. and it's, it's a fascinating field. But the fact is, is that it was considered, in the 1980s, it was considered very rare. It was considered like one in a million. Mm. But now they're talking about 4% yes. of people have got one form of synesthesia or the other. I believe this is a flowering of consciousness. And so, um, for a lot of people, they've had it all their lives, they don't know any different. But it's the start of an awareness of another way of perceiving reality. Are we opening up, in a way, to what needs I, to I be believe, opened up? I believe that what's happening is that mm. instead of um, most of the information that's coming to us or sent to, sent to us, that's in the environment, um, before most of it went over our heads and we missed it, we're just mm. picking up more of what's available what's more of the information. We're becoming in a better detector, so to speak? Yes, that's mm. what I believe is happening. Okay. I believe that it's giving us extra tools to be able to, um, to be able to process the information in the environment because some of the information I think I'm getting, um, it's, it is more, it's more than just a different way of perceiving reality. Mm. It's, it's more understanding of things. And now an important question, I think, comes up. Um, could we say that if the cosmos is changing us, but let's put it in two simple terms, and we can also change ourselves or are being changed by the cosmos and therefore can influence the cosmos in a different kind of way, this reciprocal relationship, um, could we say it's like a biofeedback loop that changes the complete outcome of the whole interaction 
And if we could say, yes, that's the case, what might be the outcome? What do you are think? you saying that um, in this transition, humans are having a stronger connection with other realms of... Well, like this speaker with a microphone, if mm. you sing, but the output of your voice gets reinforced, but gets back to the microphone again, it's reinforced again. It's reinforcing or reinforced, so it's a resonance phenomenon. Yes. Might it be that this resonance effect of our actual consciousness and intent that is changing and are being able to detect more and therefore reflect more also changes dynamics coming in again. How does that interplay work? I think you actually put that quite nicely to be honest. I think the way you said it was quite um, was quite good. I do think that um, we're, gonna, we're going to become, we're going to flower, mm -hmm. we're, go we're going to have more abilities I think that's what's actually taking place and what's actually happening. Are we a caterpillar now? Are we going to be a um, beautiful butterfly? <coughs> <coughs> and if so, what's the blueprint of that <coughs> butterfly? Because, of course, and it, this leads me to give you your last sip. This is how well, to come people, the last sip okay, of the... <laughs> you know, there's always going to be people that are way ahead, that yeah. have already have these abilities. Maybe there's just one or two of them in a million, but there's definitely people who seem to have additional abilities and I'm thinking of this is it Nina Kolodzina and um, is that the right way to pronounce her name this Russian lady yep. that had these extraordinary this abilities she was a synesthete, synesthete. Yeah. Um, mm. you know that she had the ability to well when she was knitting she would just be very lazy and couldn't be bothered and she'd just you know look at the ball of wool and, and she'd just literally pull it yeah. you know mm. She could do all sorts of things PK. she was a heal she was a healer she could move things with her mind and all this sort of thing um, so I feel that possibly we're going to get a lot more people like that. I think we're going to have people who are going to be able to use, to be able to connect with the field through their thoughts and to do extraordinary things. I do mm. think that's going to happen, but I think it will get to the point where it won't be seen as being extraordinary anymore. I think it will just be seen that's as being normal. That's my next question. Will, will the extraordinary become the new ordinary, the new normal? I think so. Um, the other thing that I've been talking about is I feel that the, the energies coming to the planet are healing energies and that people will function better. It's like, a, it's like the biological internet that DNA uses will actually function better, which is what I was thinking when you were t saying what you were saying, mm -hmm. um, that the, the connections between our DNA and the instructions will be better. I think that's what's going to happen. to have a deep question here and yes then you can take your last sip um, your book tuning the diamonds has a subtitle electromagnetism and spiritual evolution mm. we don't have to go into the deep metaphysics physics of things or the occult or esoteric but it seems to me if there's a intelligence there's progress there's development there's a changing dynamics of interrelationships and reciprocity that there has to be a cosmic plan or game or like you call it spiritual evolution are we heading towards something or is it self-organization and we don't know what is about to happen <coughs> is there an intelligence and a god or an outcome from the alpha to the omega or are we just witnesses of whatever can happen i think it's a cycle i think it's um what the Hindus I think, talk about, the yuga cycles, don't they? Yes. I think it's a cycle in the universe, and I think it's been known about. I think we've had loads of messages left for us to tell us that it's coming, um, and that um, part of the housekeeping is the fact that um, you're going to get dramatic changes, new life forms, uh, new abilities, you know, new humans. I, I think it's. Uh, I think it's. You, we have to consider that there is an intelligence that seems to operate. Um, I think the science tells us that quite clearly, to be mm. honest. Mm. Um, how does it all know how to work and how does it all fit together? I mean, it's, it's extremely complex. The, the planet and how it operates is extremely complex. Our scientists cannot m map. They can't even tell us what the weather's going to do tomorrow or the day after. I mean, it, it's, um, there is an intelligence that seems to operate and and control everything and it's interesting talking about the chaos though 
you can't make change without chaos. Mm -hmm. You have to, a system that's functioning well will not change. Otherwise, your you equilibrium have to, will not You happen. have to bring it into a state of, co of conscious mm -hmm. of, uh, chaos and then push it in a different direction. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening. I think that's what's happening when the energy is coming in from the, the cosmos. It's, but it's all controlled. It's controlled chaos. Um, so Who's controlling the chaos? Or what is controlling the cosmos? The, cha the chaos. <laughs> and the cosmos, therefore. I mean, I believe in universal intelligence. Mm -hmm. I believe that um, it's not how we were taught. If you go to the traditional religions, I don't think it's what, how we've been taught. Um, I think my sort of belief is a little bit more sophisticated than mm -hmm. other people. But I still believe that there's order in the universe. There is um, there is intelligence Ill, inbuilt into everything. Even wood has its own intelligence. Everything seems to... Water has its intelligence. Water has an awful lot of intelligence. Um, now, whether you think that's... Um, some people would say that's instinct or some, some inbuilt intelligence. Mm -hmm. Even that's a very sort of a funny statement to make, I can imagine. But mm. I, I feel there is intelligence in everything. There's instructions and coding mm. for everything yes. and some flexibility built in. I think that there's a learning process taking place. So when things happen, information gets re relayed back to source. Yep. And so then maybe another solution will come in. Does I that automatically mean that life has a purpose for you? Yes. Or for scientists? Yes. I... I, I I don't know, I just want to say this at this moment. I feel that whatever we ever go through, it, it, the information and the experience is never lost. I feel that it goes into a field uh, of information for humanity. And then that is processed at another level. And then new solutions are brought in. Nothing that we ever do, nothing we ever experience is lost. Mm -hmm. it, it gets fed back to source. And then source then makes a choice as to what's next then. What, what will I allow? What will not be allowed? And I, I, feel, I, I, feel really, I feel that really strongly. I feel that really strongly. Mm. So it's like charging up our morphogenetic fields and consciousness that's being stored, so to speak, in the Akashic fields. And when there's a critical mass, which is not matter or mass anyway, it feeds back to in actual changes in the holographic distribution that feeds back to in our reality and bodies. I'm saying this because I'm thinking about uh, an evolution theory uh, Tom Bearden has and describes in his work mm -hmm. where he actually says once the hologram has been charged up because of our intent and change in consciousness it actually feeds back, that's his theory, through scalar electromagnetic mm -hmm. let's call it torsion waves back into our, to our reality and therefore our matter. So again this biofeedback loop may be planning or uh, tuning the diamond and spiritual evolution? I think, that, I think so. I mean, y you just got to look at the, the animals and the life forms and the intelligence that is there. I mean, I, in my lectures I've been, I've discovered this beetle that has these detectors because it, it lives off scorched wood and um, it has these detectors where it it picks up infrared signals. You're not talking about Paul McCartney, yeah? No, no. Kind of beetle, right? <laughs> no, no. Okay, a go jewel on, go beetle, on. it's okay. called. And it has a detector that can, that can detect a forest fire 80 kilometers away. I mean, I think that is incredibly sophisticated. Mm. The other thing I've, um, I found out is that um, a bird knows which chick it's been, f it's been, f it's been feeding because the, 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 the skin radiates ultraviolet light differently in mm. different shades. Yes, it's radiation. And, yes. and it's like a, s a level of sophistication. Even, even the birds and the animals, and they have this level of sophistication, which I think is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I think we are part of this creation. It, it is inherently intelligent. And that intelligence is something that I believe can vary. I think that the intelligence I don't think it's necessarily one way. It's always getting high and high. It's just different variants on this thing. It's like the intelligence varies. It's, it's you know, look at the diversity on this planet. Um, and the fact that the diversity is something that can, even the diversity can vary. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes there's more diversity on the planet and there's less diversity on, on the planet. Yeah. 
but the intelligence is still there. Yeah. yeah? So I, I, I just feel that this is really, um, it, it's very interesting. I hope I haven't gone off the subject here, actually. I, I just feel that, that we just need to... Just pick another to, one. We, no, we need, no, we need to think deep, more deeply about what's taking place on the planet and mm. how we can um, adapt. I think we should be expecting changes. I think we should expect that the, in the chaos, funny things are going to happen. Um, but remember, it's, it gets picked up in the field and eventually it gets sorted out, yeah? So when I talk about funny things happening, I, I, I tend to give um, one example quite a lot, is that sometimes people are having this, um, this um, foreign accent syndrome where sometimes people, they've been had a slight illness and then they wake up and they've got a different accent. There's been stories of people waking up and they're speaking in a completely different language. Ever to me, ever and they're morning. thinking yeah. and they're thinking in a different language. To me, that's like an oddity, but it's, it's part of our reality because th there are occasional odd things that happen. They are hints ev for every, change. Every, mm. every odd thing gets fed back into the field yes. um, for... Um, improvement at some point yes so I, i'm saying i'm not saying it's going to be smooth sailing there are going to be issues with this transition but i feel that um to be positive about it and i feel that um all the um prophecies and the predictions and the the awareness of ancient knowledge that are warning us about change i feel it's all being fulfilled now and i, I think that we should be the especially people who are interested in science um spirituality, science, metaphysics. This is a time where we can say, yes, you know, we knew it was coming um, and we have some uh, ways of helping to speed the process up. Mm. And I feel that there should be more interest in this subject. It's, I think it's very, very important. Yes. You already uh, mentioned, well, let's say, spiritual evolution solutions, consciousness solutions, we have to accept that change uh, is inevitable, is coming, and that the change that we need to prepare in a way. Let's talk about the new technological solutions. What do you think if um, the cosmos has background radiation and the change is going on, might this also lead to new developments for, for instance, free energy, anti-gravity? Well, you know, we have a... This is a different lecture of another three hours, but... We, we you know, we are vul we're vulnerable. Mm. Currently, you know, there is major issues with the power grids. The way that we've set the system up, you're having these huge flux of uh, geomagnetic field, generating currents in the ground, generating currents in the air. Mm -hmm. um, transformers can only handle very, very small variations. And there is a real concern that if we have a big storm, we're going to lose the power grids. Mm -hmm. The country that seems to be the most vulnerable is the United States. But um, in 2003, when we had the Halloween storms, in South Africa, they lost 15 transformers, which is, was a real surprise. And now they're talking about new types of space weather. I don't like it. I, I, to me, this is just... Um, they keep making the rules and then the rules keep changing because mm. they don't really understand the principles behind what's really going on. By the way, the name Transformer doesn't sound very good when you're not able to transform to the change that's coming in. <laughs> well, anyway, the, yeah. the Transformers yeah. that are used to, to, to generate sure. the, you yep. know, just to send the, the power along the lines and yes. everything. But I, I, I really feel that the current setup is, was made is so vulnerable. The Americans did a, a, a study on their power grid and uh, it was released by the, I think it's the um, NSA, um, a National Scientific Organization or whatever. I mm. can't quite get the name right. But they were so frightened by what it said and, you know, it basically said we are vulnerable that they mm. decided to classify the report and hid it for five years. I mean, to me, that's not grown up. It's a bit childish, really. And then they released it again in 2012. Um, but they're vulnerable because one, one big EMP because, and bec puts bec all things Because out. they've basically run the whole system on a shoestring yeah. and um, low maintenance and, um, yeah. you know, the, the design has not kept up with the, the pace of the, the usage. So they're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, and other, obviously other countries around the world are all looking at the same thing. I mean, we had, um, I think it was 2012 in July, India had a, pa a blackout. They had two blackouts out of two days. And eventually there was half the country lost electricity because it's such a big country. That's over 600 million people. Mm. Um, 
In fact, I have whole listings of um, major blackouts where there's 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 50 million, up to 600 million people. Um, the point is, is that this is happening, as has been happening um, on a regular basis. It's if we can't recover. That's the issue. Mm. So, to go back to free energy and, um, yes, and those sort of things, mm. to me it's common sense. It's, it's yes, common sense that we don't leave ourselves vulnerable, mm -hmm. that we start to think, what can we do? I think even smaller grids would be a better idea, so that if you, you know, if we lose part of the grid, it's mm. only a small part of the grid, not, rather than the whole mm. thing going bang, and that's yeah. it. Um, so, so to me, it's pure common sense. I know there's a lot of people out there that they're power hungry, and they want to maintain the system the way it is, but... And they obviously they want to be in control, but in control of what? Because if they destroy everything, there's going to be nothing to be in control of. Mm. I, I, I don't know. I or start believing a reincarnation have better luck next time, in their cases. So I think that um, people en masse have to, have to understand the issue of our vulnerability and saying, do I want to be vulnerable? Do I want to take my invention out that's been sitting in my garage because I'm convinced there's a lot of people been doing things secretly in the background. Mm -hmm. A lot of engineers and scientists and p enthusiasts, they've been secretly creating things. I do really believe this actually. I believe Paul Violet states in his book Secrets of Anti-Gravity that has been going on from 1956. So imagine yes. what they have now. Yes, so I think that publicly funded or privately funded or just individuals making their own efforts. I think it's got to, got to get to the point where local communities start to say, if anything goes wrong, we've got this, that we can help ourselves in this way. Um, I think it's important. I think um, just hoping that nothing goes wrong is, is not a good strategy. I think that people need to start saying, we can't leave ourselves to be vulnerable. We have mm. our children to think about. But does this self-sustainability need to come bottom-up from the people or top-down? Because, of course, there you might have corruption, conflicts of interest, uh, political agendas. I'll give quarrel. you an example. Um, I've seen some reports about um, disaster preparedness. And when I spoke mm -hmm. to someone about this in academic, they said, oh, you mean those people who were just like the disaster preppers? I said, no, not the disaster preppers. We're talking major organisations, authorities that realise that we can't make us, we can't be vulnerable. We can't be unprepared when major things happen, like, for example, Hurricane Sandy, where they, not even the stock market would function. Nothing worked. I mean, people could, could, have, could actually get into the stock, you know, into the, into the stock market, but then mm -hmm. all the computers were dead. Nothing worked. The phones were dead. Nothing worked. So they're starting to think maybe it's a good idea. So that the people on the ground have been doing their preparations and, mm -hmm. you know, what we call the disaster preppers. But at a more higher level, they're starting to acknowledge, hey, this is a good idea. We really should mm -hmm. make it difficult for things to all go wrong at the same time. Maybe we should have an infrastructure that's not so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is my idea in that if we then start going to alternative energies, um, alternative devices, energies from the ether, zero point, that the sort of thing. Yeah. It, it gives us more of a fighting chance. We don't want to be in a position where we're vulnerable. We don't want to have wake up one day, the lights don't go on, nothing works, no computers, no water because you need electric pumps to pump the water into mm. people's homes. We don't want to be in that position where within 48 hours there's rioting in the UK, there was a documentary called um, Blackout, and it was basically a documentary drama. What would happen mm -hmm. if, the, if the lights went off, the power went, and, and uh, people had to survive? Back to nature. And um, the main thing was, it's just this, from my point of view, just seeing how the idiots all respond. Um, I have no other way to put it, really. The, the mm. people who are sort of oh, I'll just steal something from my next... I'll just steal petrol from my next-door neighbour. I'll just steal petrol from the tanker. And then there's a scene where the whole thing just blows up. You know, the... <laughs> next. <laughs> you know, and all the different things that would happen. But what happened was that a lot of people were quite 
astounded by this documentary. They'd never even thought of that could happen. Mm -hmm. And they approached the scholars at Oxford and Cambridge, and there's a society there um, for, for examining existential risks, which means risk to life on this planet, the, the risk to human life on this planet. And the reason why they're doing this is because they're quite worried about this, um, the transhumanist movement and yes. the idea to sort of become semi-robots and things and pick up animal, animal, futile, yes. yeah, animal DNA and become mm -hmm. superhumans. They're sort of worried about, well, will we do something that means that humans will die off in the future because we've been played about, we've played about with our DNA so much that we don't fit into the, you know, and we're gone. So they asked these scholars um, their opinion of this documentary and they turned around and said, oh yes, that's, that's quite possible. It's quite possible to, to lose the whole power grid in one go with an EMP event, which I believe is a space would be, in practically would be a space weather event. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, it might be a good idea to have a, a, you know, some spare um, provisions in the home, non-perishables, just in case. Now, I feel that was very poor advice because there's all sorts of issues about, you know, an event where it's, it's, a, it's a major disaster and how you look after yourself when there's, when there's nothing working and you know, having all sorts of supplies and water and mm -hmm. things like that. But this is the point is that um, people are only just starting to get the message that this could happen. We had in July 2012, we had a coronal mass ejection that actually, um, if it hit Earth, would have caused um, an event that would have been worse than the Carrington event. And up till um, before July 2012, we'd always looked back 150 years to this Carrington event and said that was, if that happens today, there's going to be total devastation. Mm -hmm. um, July 2012, we had a coronal mass ejection that missed the Earth by a week. If it had hit the planet, it would have been worse than the Carrington event. We're being saved, but nobody knows about it. And, uh, well, the scientists, the, scientists are, the scientists are trying to talk to the media yeah. and trying to talk to policymakers. And a guy called Dr. Daniel Baker has um, said, look, we think that we now have good data that can be used as a war game scenario. You really need to th take this seriously. What would happen if the grids went down and stayed down? Who cares about the terrorists if space weather can hit us any time? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, even the military have admitted that they are vulnerable. 90% of their operations couldn't work without electricity. Well, that's the thing I want to mention you, because I talked to Paul Violet, and he said, John, you know what? It might hit us any time. Yes. I can't talk about it. Might, and it could mm. have hit, like you said, any time. But... If it happened like a cent only a century ago, we could go back to nature and living the way we always did. And it's okay, but now with technology, communications, wireless internet and email, and people would go mad and kill each other off, and civilization would be gone probably because we are so dependent on this technology. Well, there's a lot of people just uh, addicted to their Xboxes, aren't they? What are they going to do? It's not interesting. I mean, it sounds silly, but you know, the dependence on the phones. And all the things that people are highly dependent on today. Mm. TV cameras. So, so for me, going back to the question mm. of alternative, alternative sources of energy, it's just common sense. Yes. We can't allow ourselves to be vulnerable, which is how we are at the moment. But it's the next step. But are we already too late? Do you see still hope yet? I, I really think that as the awareness comes of the seriousness of the situation, I don't want people to be frightened of space sure. weather. I don't want to, it's not about um, fear. It's not about frightening people it's into... It's about being aware. It's about being grown up. Mm -hmm. It's about understanding what's taking place around us. You know, I mean, children, a lot of children are not very aware of traffic, so they'll run into the road. Mm -hmm. Grown-up people stop at the side of the road, look both ways and cross the road. So to me, it's like being grown up you're aware of the fact that we're vulnerable and we say, okay, what can we do? Mm -hmm. What can we do to make ourselves less vulnerable? How do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our family? How do we protect our society? Mm -hmm. This is just common sense to me. It's not anything, I don't feel like an anarchist by saying this. Now, another thing like that might sound like common sense, if space weather is kicking in and there's a lot of changes coming and scientists know it, why not spray a certain chemical in the air, you know where I want to go to, 
and <laughs> protect the ozone layer and all the radiations coming in. Let's call it geoengineering. Let's call it chemtrails. Is this something you think is a reality? And if so, if the answer is yes, is it because they are trying to protect their semiconductors and their communication facilities, or maybe for the betterhood of man? But then again, if there are chemicals, if there are radioactive substances or toxic uh, chemicals inside those um, geoengineering uh, spraying machines, then it might hurt and harm humanity in the long run. So what do you think is going on with the scheme of chemtrails and geoengineering? Something well, all I can talk about is my mm -hmm. what I see with my own eyes. Sure. And that when I was living in Switzerland, um, there'd be times where you saw eight, nine, ten planes in the sky at the same time, all trying to make a grid very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I felt, because obviously I was watching what was happening with space weather, I felt that it was space weather related mm -hmm. and that basically they were trying to sort of create some kind of um, barrier. Yeah, protective because, layer. Yeah, protect, yeah, because if you have a solar flare, you're just going to get this massive of energy and fast radiation particles that come about an hour after a, a blast. And it's very damaging for electronics. Mm. Now, I know what's going on in America, and they're saying they're trying to poison us and all that sort of stuff. But just from my experience sure. and the fact that we do know that, um, that, that, that we are being flooded with particles, charged particles, and they are damaging to our electronics. Mm. I mean, we, there are major issues like um, cheap electronics in cars and stuff. Um, this had all sorts of problems with the Toyota cars with acceleration. Um, and even NASA got involved investigating whether it was cosmic rays that were causing these problems sure, with, they the, need with, to know. with the electronics. Mm -hmm. So to me, that would be, um, if, well, we know that there, there is, they're spraying. We know that for a fact that they're spraying. And has been, a, been and a I, think, right I think it's an assumption to assume that all the countries have the same reason for doing what they're doing. I think that's a big assumption that we make. Mm -hmm. I think maybe what's going on in America, because... Might change, yeah because they seem to be the most huge, the, the biggest risk takers seem mm. to be in America. Um, the, the biggest semblance of greed appears to be in America. So, so they could might be, differ from other countries. Yes, yes, they may be doing mm. more because they want sick people. They want to be able to keep the pharmaceutical mm. industry going. We don't know, but I think it's a big assumption to assume that's the same thing happening everywhere. Sure. We can't extrapolate those findings to another situation. But to me, it makes sense mm. that they'd be trying to protect the... Um, it, the technological infrastructure because it's at the moment it's extremely vulnerable the radio communication is going to pop by the it, way might it work no matter what the human consequences are might it work the geoengineering as protecting for the semiconductor industry and the telecommunications and the military operations industry might it is it a feasible solution in the first place um you think well, I think that um, the change has caught them um, unawares. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, um, for example, I've seen a few things that have surprised me, like I saw a patent, of a, I always never know whether it's patent or patent, patent um, information. Intel actually even said that um, we're living on borrowed time. They seem to be aware of the fact that the influx of cosmic radiation was only just going to get worse. And so mm. the idea that they had was a cosmic ray detector on a chip. So that um, well, as you're processing on the computer, a cosmic ray comes in, you detect it, and you say, OK, redo that calculation, because it could be wrong. Because the, you know, the charge going through the, 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 um, through the, <laughs> I've forgotten it now, through the chip, through, might, the thingy. through the chip, no, through the chip, <laughs> yes. might have, um, you know, there might have been some kind of distortion and uh, a bit flip and something might be wrong, so just redo it. Yes. To me, that is a, a solution to the problems of this, this downpour of, um, of radiation. So I, I've, I'm not sure, I, I think geoengineering is a very crude way uh, of dealing with the crisis that they've now got. And I think that... Um, but the thing is, it's, it's, it's like reinventing our reality. The way that we do things now is just so embedded in our consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, we listen to the radio, we watch TV, we have all these devices. That's so embedded in our consciousness that this is how we do things, that it's very difficult to think, to rethink of, well, how could we do this differently? What mm -hmm. could we invent that's a little Might bit the different? the solutions we now have on offer or the solutions that we now implement 
be even worse of a problem than addressing the problem itself, like geoengineering, using chemicals in the air, for humanity? Um, I think what's the problem is, is maintaining the status quo. That mentality of everything has to stay, stay the same. We Especially can't allow change. Politics, yeah. Th that's what I think the <coughs> problem is. I think that allowing people to, re to come up with new solutions there's, there's, a, there's a, a risk of losing control for certain, seems to me that's the problem, the risk, they don't want to lose control, so it's desperation. I think that the spraying is just sheer desperation. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all. And I don't want to say, well, they're definitely doing this and they're definitely doing that, because I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. But the fact that... But it um, is a reality for you, geoengineering and chemtrails. Well, we know that they definitely want to do it, and mm -hmm. they are desperate. There's all these experiments going yeah. on in the background. And, s and some of these um, experiments are a complete disaster because the, the scientists can't think. That's all the problem. They, s they, they have a very narrow vision now. If we, if we do this change, then we'll do this. And then the, but the, the universe doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. this, it's like a domino. When you want knock one down, another ten go down. It, it's, mm -hmm. Everything's related to it. They can't see the cumulative and synergistic effects. In no, the they don't run. think because they don't think long enough mm -hmm. and hard enough for any anything. Mm -hmm. So... So it's interesting because I, I do document sort of these, the, the, some of the experiments I do that seem to go wrong because they're, they're very narrow-minded in their focus. Oh, we can do this, mm. you know, like this this business to remove all the CO2. Um, plants love CO2; they bloom with. Then there's lots of CO2 mm. in the atmosphere, and yet they want to remove and it. And now we tax humans, uh, while you can also tax extraterrestrials on other planets because it's a whole universal thing. It's not just a problem for Earth because it's. A Radiation and electromagnetic problem, right? I'm not quite sure what you meant by that. <laughs> Would, I don't like I'm it. I'm not I sure what I meant I'm by not that. Sure. Uh, when you there. start yeah. talking about extraterrestrials, <laughs> I get a bit nervous because it's, it's not something that I really want to talk about too it's much. It's okay. There's one behind the camera, but just go on. Yeah. Okay. It's but uh, another thing I want to mention to you or ask you cosmic radiation, what about Fukushima, the normal radiation? What's your opinion? Oh, it's. Um, on and off. I, I, when it first happened, I spent probably the first year, just every week, I was sort of highlighting another issue and another story and things like that, and then I calmed down a bit. But basically, you really just have to wonder whether they just want to kill off an awful lot of people. You know, the, the fact... Because that, that would be the logical outcome if they keep on doing what's well, going on? Well, the, the news coming out of Fukushima just gets worse and worse, and then you think to yourself, it can't possibly get any worse, and then it just gets worse. So now they're talking about killing off the, you know, killing the Pacific. There was a, a sailor that sort of um, went sailing through the Pacific and said, everything's dead. Mm. You know, and you hear about all these whales and dolphins washing up. And then you hear about these um, dolphins having these mass meetings above Scotland, north of Scotland, where this, the fishermen are seeing, they're seeing a thousand dolphins. It's like they're having a massive conference. You think, what the hell's going on? Mm. This, you know, and then you, then you hear about... Um, people picking up these unusual um, stones, putting them in their pockets, and then you hear that there's, they've um, ignited in, and of course, um, um, you know, they've literally ignited in their pockets, so they mm. think these are these are pellets, these are actual um, the rods. Like that, spontaneous combustion, but then from stones. Yeah, but these are the these are the nuclear rods that mm. have just blew up into the air, got into the sea, and they've crossed over the, to the across the Atlantic, mm. they've been picked up on the coast, South America and North America, there's been these stories of these people picking up these green pellet things, not knowing mm. what they are, thinking they're unusual stones, and you think, this is ridiculous, this mm. is awful. So you know, you're, you're getting um, the oceans literally dying, can you imagine that? Besides all the fact that you've got all this pollution in Fukushima and you've got this black substance that is now appearing around Tokyo, then you've had this yellow cake rain. It, the whole thing is bizarre when you consider what the Russians did when they had Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. They, um, you know, it took them a week to get a grip and start to do something. But Fukushima, it's just like, oh well, just um, we yeah, pretend. Fukushima is way and, bigger. Or, and again. the thing with Fukushima, we don't know if it was just Fukushima. There was two sites, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Fukushima, Di Daiichi and Daini, mm. but also other nuclear power stations that they've said very little about. Yes. So it could be that there are quite a few um, nuclear power stations that have melted down. It might not just be the 
the five that we know of. So the eco side that's going on it might be even worse than we can it imagine. C it could be far worse than that's already public knowledge. Yes. And, and But anyway, the news coming out is absolutely awful. Do they just want to poison off and kill off huge numbers of people? You really have to think about that. Mm. Because they don't seem to have done anything. Now they're talking about freezing everything underground. But, you know, they've left it very late. I wish they I could freeze humanity at this moment. But well, I could keep thinking <laughs> of Edgar Casey and, you know, mm -hmm. his, his, opi his opinion that Japan has to fall into the sea. And the way he put oh, that's it, one of his prophecies. One so of his yes, prophecies: yes. Japan has to fall into the sea. And you think to yourself, "Well, it sounds like a good thing to me." I know, I know it sounds cruel when you mm. think of all those millions of people, mm. but we've got to think about the future of our world. Now, because I nuclear, think nuclear, you can water. You well, I th yes. well, I think whatever happens, um, humanity will survive and the Earth will survive, yes. even if it means that huge numbers of people are going to die in the meantime. Mm there will be a remnant of people and the planet will survive. Yes. Um, now, th with Fukushima, in my mind, that's linked to the, to the low sperm count and the fact that even countries like India now uh, seem to have um, much fewer children being born. Mm -hmm. And if this keeps going, um, in three, four hundred years, there's going to be far less people on the planet just because of these issues with the sperm count. We have to build arcs. Like Google, you mean? Mm? Have you I heard, mean those have big you boats have you heard, where we have, have, have the you heard, mail. Have you heard about these Google arcs? Google arcs? Google no? have been building these massive barges oh, that's a story. and, yeah, put, yeah. and yeah. putting in server after server yes. after server. And then somebody noticed and said, what's going on here? And then Google spent about two weeks sort of... Um, uh, what shall we say? Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be educational centres. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now they've been building them um, in various um, boatyards. Um, and the, these places where they've been building them are saying, you know, you really don't have permission to have these massive barges parked up. You're going to have to move them. Mm -hmm. But I felt, um, it seemed obvious to me, and a lot of obviously other people have, been, have paid attention to like, what's going on. Uh, a lot of people in the computer world, because obviously Google are watched heavily, um, it, it seems obvious to me that these are arcs. If, the, if um, we have a geomagnetic storm, the power goes down, all Google need to do is they need to f they'll float their barges out to sea, um, they can use the electricity from seawater, they can go. I suppose they'll use a satellite link up or whatever they mm. can, or whatever's left. They they will be able to just operate. And I think what these what, what these barks um, arcs are, sorry, mm. barges actually on arcs. We might barks. call them barks. <laughs> barks. <Yes. laughs> but, but but don't let the dog bark. <laughs> That's another story. Barges and arcs, barks. <laughs> that might catch on actually. <laughs> <laughs> we just so. introduced a new term. <laughs> So anyway, um, I we, we got we got sidetracked there really, on, and but th that's interesting actually that there definitely seems to be um, effort to to recognition of the signs of the times and where where things are at. Well, if you know when to be prepared and what to be prepared for, then you can act. But it's the elite that seems to know, but we, the people, are still clueless. That's I, th I think it's about processing information and coming mm. up with logical conclusions. There's, you know, this whole space weather thing's been accelerating for 25 years. It's not just the last few years. Sure. Things have been getting gradually worse and worse and worse and worse. I mean, like GPS, for example. They now freely admit GPS used to be accurate to one meter. Now they're saying, well, on a good day, it's just one to three meters. Mm. And like you said, all the cosmic constants are not constant anymore. Exactly. But they're saying on a bad space weather day, they can be tens of meters out. And a lot of people, when you talk about GPS, they have their own experience of using GPS in the cars. It's not mm. accurate. So, for t so to me, it's just using logic, mm. allowing yourself to think and you say, what if? What if? And it got to the point where obviously big companies like Google think, well, we'll, uh, we'll be shut down. If we don't at least have some preparations, we've got big hordes of cash, maybe we should use some of that money to have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. But at this point in time, 
are we like the electromagnetic canaries in the coal mine? You think? When you say we, who are we? <laughs> the people who are clueless at this point that space weather is going on and might hit us anytime and are surprised to find out that their life isn't like it used to be. I think what it is is a drip drip effect. I think that uh, for people paying attention, um, you hear it once, you hear it twice, you hear it three times and then you start to think, okay, maybe I should do something. Mm. It takes the time. Yes. And for some people, they've been hearing it for a long time, and so they're starting to make a change and started to make, to make preparations, like Google, for example. I think for a lot of ordinary people, their lives are very busy, jobs, you know, struggle for survival or whatever. Sure. So it doesn't really filter. I think that um, I think the people who have more resources. It's not just, for them, it's not just looking after themselves and their family. They should be thinking about society. That's what I think. Um, mm. I, I feel that... And we um, are all in this together in the end, right? Well, we really rely on each other. Societies, that's how societies are, are, are built, is, mm. is, is that we rely on people, total strangers total strangers coming to our homes on a regular basis to do jobs and go out. I mean, we have this system that we've, we've developed. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel that it, it's for um, people who have the resources to start using their influence to make a change. And it's actually, it helps your survival. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to, you know, it's okay that there is a certain type of person, the psychopath type person, the, the, the narcissist type person that only thinks about themselves, but mm. they're only a small percentage of society. Normal society should be thinking of, in terms of survival mm. of society. Um, now, for whatever reason, um, the message isn't getting through. I'm doing my best. I, I feel like... Um, I'm I'm quite happy that I've made the commitment I've made mm -hmm. to do st to talk about space weather, especially as it's becoming it's really accelerating yes. now, um, and um, especially after this thing in July 2012, they I knew that things were going on in July 2012. We'd had all these major blasts and things were you know, but it took them a year for the for the information to filter through. Yes, it takes time, yes. and um, it's. It's quite interesting. I, I feel we're at a point now where it's gone past it being a joke now. And I think that this is the time I really want people to stand up um, and say, I can do something, I can contribute. I would love for the inventors and the engineers for, to see more new inventions. And to make it open source so we can all profit? Yeah. Not profit, but... Benefit. Profit, benefit, benefit, that's the word. I that mean, for the all spiritual evolution, not for money or technological. Well, I, I, I feel that it is spiritual for, to people, for people to do what they can do to help society. To do that, the right thing. That is spiritual yes. um, to me. From, mm -hmm. That's from my point of view. Um, well, however people can help. Uh, but I want to see the engineers coming through. Mm -hmm. I want to see the inventors coming through. I want to see the devices that... Um, it's not. It's not about anarchy. It's about thinking of the future. Mm -hmm. That we've got to turn it around. It's natural evolution. In yeah, I know way. that there are people with vested interests, and in the past, if people have had inventions like being able to power a car on water, then they've ended up dead and stuff like that. It is. It is a concern, but we've got to think of the future. We've got to think with you know this space weather is not going away. Mm. It's just getting worse. It's, <laughs> I would say the pioneers were the one that stepped outside the box, mm. but now we all have to realize we're in a completely new kind of box to step into, actually. Yes, I think so. Because the change is so eminent and so serious. Yeah, and it's not a case of, oh, if that happens, it's going to affect my neighbors, it won't affect me. Mm. It will affect everybody. We're in the same boat together, or the same ark or bark or whatever, <laughs> we, but we, we need more boats probably, and we need it soon. <laughs> Um, I would like to close this show mm -hmm. with, uh, well, with mentioning go to healingsoundmovement.com. I was John Consumer. We'll have a good time and bye bye. But to have you as uh, final remarks for what you think is needed in a few sentences, or you can also address them in a half an hour, whatever you want, for what might be 
helpful for all people, for the betterhood of mankind, what is the right thing to do in these troubled times, which actually are chances for transformation, to do the right thing? First of all, I was thinking, I don't know what to think. And then I thought, kindness. Kindness. I feel that we've got to be less selfish and we have to start looking out for each other. It has to be something that's second nature. So whenever we need see someone in help, instead of saying, oh, I can't be bothered, maybe just turn it around and think, well, what can I do? What can I do? You know, if you've got a wardrobe full of clothes, maybe you could just give some of them away to the charity shop or something. It, it, I know it sounds silly, but it's, we've got to have a mentality of supporting each other, mm. of being supportive. You know, and also that has to be normal. So that if someone's in trouble, you help them. But if you're in trouble, someone helps you. Mm -hmm. It has to be seen to be normal because we're all in this together. Mm. And that if anything happens, you know, there's got to be people that help with water supply and help with provisions and help with clothing and help with fire and energy and fuel. But I feel that it's got to be in a society where it's normal to help other people. I feel it'd be better if we became less selfish mm. and less narcissistic. Through altruism. Yeah. I, for some reason, kindness was the word that came into my mind. Mm. I feel that. I feel that um, th that's, what, that's what we have to change. We have to become less narcissistic. Mm. And, and to me, that's more spiritual. This would be the, the opposite of that. Thank you for that. Well, we are the ones we've been waiting for, so let's not wait anymore, but do the right thing and mm. be kind. I want to thank you for your kindness and your hard work, your amazing book. Again, for the listeners, don't doubt in these doubtful times. Just buy it <laughs> or ask <laughs> as a gift because you need it. Tuning the Diamonds for the Dutch people, afstemming up the cosmos, ankhemus.nl. Uh, our website is healingsoundmovement.com um, for Susan, go to susanrenison.com or joyfirepublishing.com for the book. Thank you for your time and thank you, Susan. For this talk. Thank you for inviting me. In the, for thank talk. you, Guido. Want to know? Dot there we go for inviting Susan to actually come sit here. Thank you. Bye bye.